at, at Brentwood, we get spoiled, and, um, and we take certain things for granted, and I know I do. Uh, but this past week, Dennis Worley and I were in a meeting, and Dennis said just off the cuff, flippantly, as if it ought to be something that I should know. He said, he said, and our orchestra, he said, our orchestra is one of the best church orchestra in the nation. This is Mike Lawrence who heads up that ministry. So, Mike, I just wanted to tell you, man, just every now and then we forget. But I just want to tell you today we remembered. So, so thanks for your work, man. Tell the orchestra for me, okay? Thank you. <clears throat> Did you know that since the beginning of the Middle Tennessee Initiative, this campus, Brentwood Baptist Church, 77 to 77 Concord Road, has sent out 1,050 members to our other eight camp, to our other seven campuses. 1,050 of our members. Now, let me qualify that. That's the ones we know about. Okay, that's the ones that I can say, hey, here's the name, here's, uh, here's where they transferred, told us, I'm not going to Brentwood anymore, I'm going to Ave South, I'm going to Station Hill, uh, that kind of thing. We, there's a group of attenders who never told us that they were members who have gone, we know that. Uh, but 1,050 of our members are now part of our other campuses. And that investment has already been paid back in the growth of Station Hill, in the growth of Nolansville, uh, in the growth of Avenue Side, and the growth of all of our campuses. We have already uh, replenished that in all of our attendance. Now, as you can imagine, that leaves lots of opportunities here for the 37027 campus for, for this one. Uh, just as every one of our campuses is unique, uh, this one is unique. Uh, Brentwood, the, the city of Brentwood is unique. And we have to understand that we are missionaries to this 37027 culture. And so we're taking a lot of uh, deep dives into what this means and having a lot of conversations about the opportunities that uh, this uh, opens up for us. Now, that will probably mean some change. I know the only person who likes change is a wet baby. Everybody else doesn't like it. Uh, but we have to understand we are missionaries to this culture. If you thought we lived in a Christian nation, if you thought we lived in a Christian culture, I hope you have been disabused of that view. And um, understand we're now in a pagan culture and but this is where the gospel can shine its brightest and uh, and so we're excited about that so you'll be hearing more about that but I thought you'd want to celebrate that we've sent out over a thousand fifty members uh, to plant these other these other congregations people who study the English language tell me that there's a lot that makes English very difficult to learn uh, one is uh, the same word can mean a lot of different things. Uh, and if you don't know the context, if you're not paying attention to the vocal inflections, then you will miss the meaning. Uh, I love my children. I love pizza. Same word, yeah, but not the same meaning. And of course, there's always the great, um, oh yeah, I love that. Same word, different context, different meanings, different vocal inflections can change everything about the word. So it makes English a very difficult language to speak and speak well. The other thing is, is that words change meanings. Uh, when I was in elementary school, I would be punished if I was a bad boy. By the time I got to high school and college, the greatest compliment you could have given me was to say, Mike Glenn, you're a bad boy. <laughs> yeah, if I was on the basketball court and somebody walked by me and go, you're a bad man, Mike Glenn, oh yeah, you live for that. Same word, but its meaning changed over the years. And every now and then, the world will take a word from us and change its meaning. 
And every now and then, we need to tell the world, no, we're not going to give you that word. We're not going to let you change its meanings. And love is one of those words. Love means everything but love in our culture. And we need to tell the world, we want that word back. We're not going to let you change the meaning. In the words of the great theologian, Keb Moe, that's not love because you don't feel good inside. That's not love because you're sad all the time. That's not love. I don't know what it is, but that's not love. One of the things we need to tell the world is, hey, I, I don't know what that is. But that's not love. Interestingly, Jesus was asked about this, and he answered in Mark chapter 12. Stand with me in honor of God's word. And one of the scribes approached Jesus, and when he heard, when the scribe heard the people debating and saw that Jesus had answered the crowd well, he asked him, he said, Which command is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater command than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have correctly said he is one, and there is no one except him. And to love him with all of our heart and all of our understanding and all of our strength and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, for it is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus saw how the scribe had answered wisely. Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one questioned him anymore. Love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. As the scribe came around you, Father, as they pushed you in these questions, Lord Jesus, Help us understand what really matters so that if we live our lives, we will live lives that count. And we pray this in your name. Amen. The moment was growing ever more serious. The crowds around Jesus were more somber. Things were coming to a head. It was one thing when Jesus was a country preacher preaching in Galilee and areas north of Jerusalem. That was one thing. They could always write him off as a bumpkin. But now he was in Jerusalem. Now he was drawing crowds. Now he was challenging both the political and religious leaders of his day. Early in the Gospel of Mark, we're told that all the religious and political leaders had decided that Jesus had to go. But now they were pressing their moment. They were hoping to catch Jesus in a word game. They were going to hold a press conference and ask a series of gotcha questions, hoping that he would say the wrong word the wrong way. And they could turn to the people and say, say see, he's not the Messiah. Did you hear what he said? Did you hear what he said about this or about that? And they could turn the people against Jesus. So they asked him a series of questions. The first one, do we have to pay taxes? Nothing's changed, folks. <laughs> if Jesus were here at this day, at the end of March, as April 15th is breathing down on us, one of us, our first question would be, really, Jesus, do we have to pay taxes? Nothing has changed. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. Hmm. That's a pretty good answer, Jesus. What about this one? A woman married a man and he died. And another, and she married his brother, and he died. Now, she does this seven times. Whose wife will she be in heaven? Huh, 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 huh? 
That was from the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, and this was the t- question that they used to taunt the Pharisees, who did believe in the resurrection. This is also the question that got me thrown out of New Testament class. <laughs> well, come on, people, this is funny, right? One man married a man, he died, married a man, another man, he died. So I started laughing. Dr. Garland does a professorial, you know. Mr. Glenn, you want to share with the class what's so, so, so funny? No, I'm good. Really. I just, it's just funny to me. <laughs> he said, no, 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 I insist. I said, okay, let me get this straight. There's a woman, she married a man, he's dead. She married another man, he's dead. Another man, he's dead. Somebody ought to get in the kitchen and sniff the meatloaf. Something's not right. <laughs> this woman needs to be under investigation. What would you have done if you were brother number four? You've been to three funerals, you're next. That got me the heave-ho. He went on to be the president of Baylor. I'm here. You don't know what you're talking about, Jesus told them. For women and men aren't given in, or in marriage, nor do they get married. And God the Father says he is the father of Abraham. He is the Lord of Abraham. Not that he was. Mm. Good answer. Now here's one you won't get because nobody gets it because really there's no right answer. Tell us. Which is the most important commandment? Now, there were several hundred commandments, and you could always argue this commandment against that commandment. Sure, that's a good answer. But it was one of those questions that you could never fully answer. There just wasn't any way to do it. Jesus does something really unique. One, he quotes Scripture. Anytime Jesus is challenged, anytime Jesus is tested, more times than not, He responds by quoting Scripture. Hint, hint. Maybe if that was an important way for Jesus to answer, that should be the way you and I answer. Memorize Scripture, learn to quote Scripture in those moments of our testing. And he does something really unique. He takes two different Scriptures and pulls them together. The first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul and all your strength. That is found in Deuteronomy 6. Love your neighbors, you love yourself? Ah, that's Leviticus 19. Jesus took these two commandments and put them together and said, if you do this, then you will have kept every commandment that God gave us. Love God, love each other, love yourself. Now, This is one of those sermons that requires some audience participation. So I want you to take out the bulletin they gave you or some kind of piece of paper, and I want you to draw on it in that little space they gave you for sermon notes. I want you to draw a triangle, just a triangle. Okay, three sides, looks like a pyramid, triangle. At the top of this triangle, I want you to put God. On either side of that triangle, I want you to put self and neighbor. God at the top, neighbor at one end, self at the other end. In the middle of that triangle, I want you to write love. Now, I have just given you the visual aid you will need to answer every question for the rest of your life. Anytime you get in a situation and you think, what should I do? Pull out this visual aid. It will give you your answer. You're welcome. Now, this is an interesting, interesting thing, isn't it? We want to love God. And the reason it starts with loving God is, as I've told you before, another word, another definition for glory is mass, weight. We give God glory because He is the only one who, can ha- who has the weight, the mass, the gravitational weight 
to hold the rest of our lives in their proper place and in their proper orbit. You get your life together by first putting God at the center of your life. If you put anything else or anybody else in the center of your life, everything else will fall out of order. You don't have enough gravity to hold them in place. If you put your career in the center of your life, it won't hold your marriage together. It won't hold your family together. It's not strong enough. If you put your career or your ego in the, in the center of your life, the rest of it will fall out of place. Why? You're not strong enough to hold it all together. So we begin by putting God in the center of our life because there's nobody like him. He goes in the center. Now, I've told you before that if you start being serious about loving God, he will bring you someone to love. He'll bring you a neighbor. Now, we have a lot of interesting discussions about who our neighbor is, right? The guy's on either side of you, the guy behind you, and the guy across the street. That's neighbor. And we have a lot of interesting debates in Baptist life about how many houses you have to go down the street before you run into someone who is not your neighbor. Right? Is that five houses, six houses, whatever. Jesus gives us an interesting way to, to understand this. He redefines it. What you'll find out in this passage is that Jesus has redefined every one of these things. One, in Luke chapter 10, we're told the story of the Good Samaritan. Do you remember the story? A man is traveling between Jerusalem and Jericho. He's, he's beaten and attacked and robbed and left for dead. Uh, a couple of religious leaders walk by, don't help him. A Samaritan stops and helps him. Now, understand, the Samaritan was not driving one of those yellow vans that you see on the interstate with flashing red lights. He was not on a rescue mission. Okay, he was going on his day. In the middle of his day, he found somebody who needed help from him. Now, he wasn't a doctor, so he didn't do surgery. He got him to a place where they could get help. He was traveling, he wasn't staying, so he could not provide shelter for the person. So he got him in a place where they'd be cared for, where they'd be warm and out of the weather, and their, and their needs tended to. He, took, he didn't do any of that. It wasn't what he was good at. But he got them to a place where they could get the help they needed. Jesus says, your neighbor is the person that you run into in the course of your day who needs you. It's not that you're out looking for them. It's just Monday. And you will walk into somebody who needs you to be a friend. Do you know one of the growing crises of our nation is loneliness? People are lonely. And this week, somehow, some way, you're going to be going through your day and you're going to meet someone who needs a friend. That's your neighbor. Now, you're going to say, well, Mike, what in the world can I do? I can barely hold my own stuff together. Ah, well, that comes from a healthy self-love. The world stinks at this. They stink at this. They tell us that we have to have a high self-esteem. And you know how you get high self-esteem? You lie to your children. Oh, yeah, you can't tell your kid the truth. Right? You lie to them. So your kid is playing baseball. He doesn't come close to hitting a ball, okay? Drops three fly balls. The other members of the team hate him, okay? And what are you supposed to say? Fella, you did great. Now, he knows you're lying, okay? He knows you're lying. Now, he's sitting there going, okay, I thought I stunk it up. But daddy says, I did great. So they learn not to trust themselves. No. You tell the kid the truth. Baseball is not your thing, bud. <laughs> That's all right. That's why you're a kid. 
because you get to try a lot of different things and you get to have fun and you don't have to be great at any of them. I hear a lot of people playing soccer. I don't know anything about it, but we can watch it on YouTube. We'll figure it out. You know where that self-love comes from? It comes from being chosen. Oh, yeah, that's what the Bible says about you. It's in the first chapter of Ephesians. Chosen. Second chapter of 1 Peter. Beloved. I'm picked. I've told you about this before, right? You go out on the ball field, you're going to choose up teams. The best athletes are choosing teams. You know who's going to win the game. It's always the same person. The best athlete, whoever they choose, they're going to win. And the best athlete chooses you. Now, you're still sorry. You still can't play, but now you're on the winning team because you were chosen. Don't you understand what the Bible says is that the, is that the gospel is this, is that Jesus chose you. Okay? walked up to you sometime in your life, called you by your name, and said, get behind me. I want you on my team. Wasn't anything you did. Wasn't anything you deserved. Wasn't anything I did. We were chosen. So when the world tells you you're not this, you're not that, you're not this, you just look at them and smile and go, yeah, but I'm picked. I know what team I'm on. And when you allow Jesus to begin to pour that into your life and his, his goodness and his love for you begins to flow in you and through you and fill up all of those broken places and all of those cracks and plug up all those leaks, you're able to love yourself and to understand that you are a bearer of the Imago Dei, that you are somebody who is so precious that Jesus Christ gave his life for you. And you're free. You don't need anything from anybody. You can love your friend and let your friend be your friend. You don't need them to love you back. Why? Because my life is filled up with Jesus. That's why. Now, people come to me, oh, we want to get married, Mike. Why? We need each other. That is so sick. <laughs> it's neurotic. All right, here, here's the bad news about my marriage. Jean, Jeannie doesn't need me. She would do really well without me. She wants me. That's a lot more fun than being needed. A lot more fun. No, I, I, I don't need anything from you. And no matter what you think about me and no matter what you say about me, Jesus has promised that nobody's strong enough to pull me out of his hands. And you won't be able to do anything to change the fact that I'm picked. You're picked. Because the love of God flows in you, through you, and out of you. Sloshes, you can't hold the ocean in a thimble. And it sloshes out of you, and that's the way that you love your neighbor. Now, what do we mean by love? An intense emotion? Uh-uh. That was redefined in a couple of different places. John 15. There's no greater love than this, than you lay down your life for your friends. You want to know what love looks like? It looks like laying down your life. So we love our neighbor. We lay down our life for our neighbors. We love God. We lay down our life for God. How many of you have ever got to the point in your prayer where you've asked Jesus, what do you want from me? What do you need from me? What can I do for you? Most of us go to Jesus with a long list of things we need him to do for us. We never get to the point of our prayer where it's, hey, I love you. I'm here to do for you. What do you need? What do you want? The Corinthians couldn't get this straight either. So Paul wrote the beautiful chapter of 1 Corinthians. This is what love is. Before that, at the end of chapter 12, he says, you're arguing about spiritual gifts, but if you'll listen to me, I want to teach you a more excellent way, a better way. And he goes into, if I have all the gifts, but I don't have love, then I'm nothing. Then he tells us what it is. Love doesn't keep a list of wrongs. Love doesn't celebrate when evil triumphs. 
This is what love looks like. This is what love does. It's not a feeling. It's the way we live. It's the way we act. It's what we do. Why? Because the essence of God himself, 1 John chapter 4, is that God is love. It is the essence of who he is. And when you're with him long enough, it becomes the essence of who you are. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. What you find out when you start doing this is you can't do one without doing all three. Right? Because some of us have made that famous resolution, I'm going to love people this year. <laughs> yeah, how long did that last? You can't. People are too hard to love in your own strength. It has to be the power of the risen Christ who's loving them through you and in you. And yes, there is an enemy, there is an accuser who will remind you all the time of how you have failed how you have blown it and why in the world Jesus would love you, he will never figure out. And I know a lot of you are having that conversation right now. That's what the adversary says about you. But we have an advocate who stands in the presence of the Lord, sits at his right hand, and makes intercession for us. So my friend, when you're in those moments, when the enemy is accusing you, you stay in that prayer long enough till you can hear what Jesus says about you. Chosen, beloved, image bearer. You can start anywhere you want to with this one. But start. Start somewhere. Start now. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm not going to put you on the spot, I'm not going to embarrass you. You certainly, I don't want to do that. It's just me and you. And some of you hate yourself, don't you? You really think the world would be better off without you. You're wrong. God himself says you're wrong. There's a part of the universe that you were created for. There's a part of creation that you alone, you alone fit in that makes that moment, that place complete. There was something in mind when he created you. Now, I know you're thinking, uh, you don't know, my, you, you wish you could tell me all the things you've done wrong and all the reasons that God can't love you. Please don't leave here without giving one of us the chance to tell you about how much Jesus does love you. We're waiting for you at the table. The next, it's right next under a big sign that says next steps. Just go and say, hey, I want to know more about what Mike was talking about. They'll pick up the conversation from there. Start. Maybe it's to find a group of friends you can do life with. So come on. Let us tell you about what it means to be part of Brentwood Baptist Church and this great adventure God has us on. You come. We'd love to have you part. They're waiting in the same place. Some of you will go back out into the world and you'll hear that word love and you'll wonder what it is. And you'll remember the song from Kevin Moe that says, I don't know what that is, but that's not love. Remember a Jesus who picked you, who died for you, and who now lives for you. So you can love God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. Again, I don't care where you start, but start now. Lord Jesus, every life is now open, every heart. So we pray now the choice, the decisions we make, 
know exactly what you want.